I shouldn't have made it. I shouldn't have made it. <laughs> Stopping and bopping and hanging out with it. waiters. And, I, like, <laughs> I shouldn't have made it out. I shouldn't have made it out. If someone thinks they're going to write a tell-all book about me, they're not going to make any money. They're going to be like, she already told, she told us, us that. that. <laughs> she told us that. Hey, everyone. I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Everybody, welcome back to the Journey Podcast. I am here with Sarah Jakes Roberts. I'm so excited. Today, we're going to talk about faith. I'll share a little bit about my own personal journey um, as well as get, as get into how she became this incredible mogul, powerhouse, pastor for so many women. She is a New York Times bestseller. She has a new book coming out soon, so we'll talk about that. And I'm just so excited that you're here with us today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited. You're like one of my favorite people from afar, so this is going to be a good time. Same. Same. So... I met Sarah. She and I was in LA and I was looking for, I was struggling with who I wanted to be. LA was a very intoxicating place for me. There was always something going on. It was constantly, do you want to go to these screenings? And oh, are you invited to this party in Hollywood Hills? And doing your Botox, like just so many like layers that as someone from the Midwest, I hadn't thought about how I was going to participate or not participate in the scene and everyone around me seemed to be participating. So I had a hard time deciding whether I was going to opt in or opt out or kind of just what my grounding was. And so I grew up going to church with my grandma, a billion, just like a typical grandma where I sit in the same place every week and do the same things every week. And uh, kind of my first introduction to church community And it was a church my parents got married in, the church my mother went to, you know, just like a traditional black church. And then as I got older and I had more independence to decide if I was going to go to church or not, my family didn't go as much, but I actually decided that I wanted to go and spend time with my grandma and go with her. So I would spend the night at her house on Sunday or my mom would like, you know, drive me to to church and then I would hang out with my grandma. I went to an all girls Catholic high school. It's very different than Episcopalian, so I wasn't as familiar with like Catholicism. To some extent, some of the judgment that was present in the teachings and in the programming of the school as well. I had never prayed so much in my life before. (laughs) Like you go to Spanish class, you pray in Spanish, Hail Mary. But when you're in every single class, you say a prayer. And I'm not, I'm a very progressive person too. So like, you know, you really had to participate in things like they did the March for Life every year. And that was like a big thing. Um, I'm uh-huh. not going to DC for this. It's like, we're not doing that. So it was uh, helpful in going into the fundamentals of being a woman of faith and what that meant and actually studying women of faith. And, you know, in your first book or your second book, actually, Woman of All, you talk about Eve a lot. So, you know, we yes. learned that quite a bit. It was kind of like, oh, I don't like the structure. Like, I don't like uh-huh. the black or white, the yes or no, the good, the bad. I, I, I didn't, that actually turned me off. So then in college, I was like, I'm out. <laughs> like I've had enough right. of this. So after college, when I moved and, you know, wound up in California, I think that I was missing that connectivity and I found your church and you and your husband, of course. I was like, Yes, PT is fantastic, but I fell in love with you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is so good. Um, And then, you know, I downloaded the app and I got on the YouTube and then it was, you know, I was, I was set. And one of the things that really, I think was really helpful for me was just how unapologetic you were about being yourself. And I had never actually heard from a woman pastor. Hindsight is kind of odd, but I had that just wasn't my experience. And so I resonated so much with so many of the things that you talked about, particularly, you know, just beating to your own path and having your own set of criteria for what success and happiness and joy looks like. And, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for that. And I think 
the impact that you've had on me and just so many people, of course, is evident in the work and the scale of your platform. But uh, just your storytelling capacity and leadership is just like, you've changed my life so much. So thank you. Thank you, Morgan. That means so much to me coming from you. I mean, we've we've never talked about the impact, but that means a lot. I mean, thinking that something that I've said or done has been impactful in your life as much of a world changer and innovator as you are, that's quite the honor. Yeah. Okay. So tell the world who's maybe not as familiar with you, yeah. how, like about your journey, you know, you had mm-hmm. a untraditional upbringing <laughs> Yes. And uh, what should the people know? Where, where would you, did your journey start from your perspective? So my journey starts in Charleston, West Virginia. I was born there. I lived there until I was about seven to eight years old. Uh, so half of my childhood in Charleston, West Virginia, the other half in Dallas. But those formative years of connection, of innocence, all started in the context of this like rural, small town upbringing. My father was pastoring even then, but the church was very small. We knew everyone. Everyone was like a surrogate aunt or uncle. And so it felt like a very safe, very connected world. We moved to Dallas in 1996. I was eight years old. And that first Sunday, 1,500 people joined our church. Wow. Uh, Yeah. Overnight, just I would say from what I know now, because I'm able to give it languages overnight, that sense of safety was gone. Mm -hmm. And it felt like we were in a sea of people and strangers who were fascinated with who my dad was as Bishop T.D. Jakes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that radical shift in hindsight helps me to understand a lot about how I felt more and more disconnected from church. And more like a person who knew well what it felt like to be in a room full of people, but to feel like no one fully understood you. As a result of that, you know, my sister is like this powerful prayer warrior. My brothers can sing and I can do none of those things. Like I'm not a singer. People know me for who I am now, but like, you know, prayer, sure. Like I got you in my prayer closet by myself. Right. And so I felt very disconnected, but there were other kids within that church who felt disconnected too. And when you're spending Monday through Sunday at church, that disconnection creates opportunity for you to get to know people, share rap lyrics, we're listening to Mm -hmm. stuff that we know we're not supposed to be listening to. But there was a sense of community in that. I got pregnant at 13 years old. I think looking for connection by any means necessary. I had my son at 14. For me, that just kind of confirmed, like, you're definitely not one of those girls, not one of the good girls. You know, the purity culture was rampant then. Like, don't worry about the promise ring. You're not saving yourself. You might as well stay further isolated. Ten years of my life from the time I had my son up until I turned 23 was basically just a series of different toxic forms of trying to soothe myself, whether that was through achievement. Even though I got pregnant at 13, I accelerated my high school path. Mm -hmm. National Honor Society graduated at 16, going right into college. I burn out my sophomore year. I'm like, whatever. I'll start waitressing at a strip club. I can get cash fast. Still toxic relationships, toxic marriage, abusive marriage. I get divorced at 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And after spazzing out over infidelity and they called the police on me, police doesn't, they don't arrest me, but they told me I need to go see CPS. This is a long story. Um, but right, that's walking, why it's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking out of CPS and I'm finally thinking to myself, like, I don't know if I can ever be one of the good girls. Like, I don't know if I can ever be one of the church girls, but I think I can do better than this. Like, I think I can do better from this. And that singular phrase is the thing that like changed my entire life and really began the work of what people see now. And I think what people are impacted by now is that it wasn't perfect. It wasn't about doing everything the right way. It was you are going to have to really have the faith to believe that these things that you've heard your whole life in church can in some way apply to you. I discovered that. I hung on to it. I thought it would be my little secret. I started letting little pieces of it seep out. And it turned out that what I needed as a secret was what other people needed as well. 
And I think that that is ultimately the core of what people experience. Mm, I think that's right. I mean, that, that pretty much sums up my experience through you of like exactly what I was re- rebutting or like going up against is exactly what I needed to break free of the expectations and the pressures and the external things that I felt like, oh, a CEO needs to do it this way. A founder who's successful does it this way. A person who lives in LA and is is well-liked or always invited to the things operates this way. And that was, in a lot of ways, made me suffocate. <laughs> yeah, so I was, that's the word I was going to use, suffocating. It's suffocating. Anyone who might be struggling that that's listening to this, like what is your advice for someone who is managing all of these pressures and how do you break free of the shackles? I mean, you talk about this in some of your sermons and that I've listened to, but how do you break free from those shackles of expectations and pressure? I think it starts with really identifying, like, what is it that you want? Like, if you weren't worried about how it would be perceived, if you weren't worried about how it would delay you, if you weren't worried about how it would make you look less than or like you're being so simple, like, what is it that you really want? And if you can begin to give that language, you can then ask yourself, why can't I have it? And are these reasons legitimate? Or are these reasons imposed on me by someone else's expectations? Qualifying what you want, qualifying why it is you can't have it. And then I think ultimately laying it all out in the context for me of my relationship with God, like, well, well, what do you say I can have? Like, what do you think is possible for me? What is your grace? What is your plan? What is your anointing going to back up? Mm. Even if it's unconventional, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's going against the grain, against what everyone says, if you're willing to back this up, I'm willing to take the first step and I don't know where it's going to go and I don't know how to change my life, but at least I'll be authentic to myself and I'll be in connection with you. And at the end of the day, that's enough for me. I tell myself often, like, there's no statistical reason I should be where I am today. Like, Mm. it is only through him that this is possible. Like, I, I feel that. You know, like... I think about all the ratchet stuff I did in St. Louis where I'm like, I shouldn't have made it. And then I think about when I graduated from college and I moved to the Bay Area and I was thotting and bopping and hanging out with it. waiters. And, I, like, <laughs> I shouldn't have made it out. I shouldn't have made it out. <laughs> you know, when I think about this, so, that part of the reason why I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, because if someone thinks they're going to write a tell all book about me, they're not going to make any money. They're going to be like, she already told, she told us, us that, that. <laughs> she told us that she's not, she was rolling them things up, baby. Like she was knocking them things back. Like whatever it is that you think you got to put out there on me. I just want you to know, I don't know. I don't know. Yes. This. Some of the things I'm not proud of. Some things, they still make me cringe, but but it is what it is, and I am who I am, and here we are. This is what it is. Right. That's right. I, if I tell people something, I'll tell you one story. People will like be like, no, this didn't happen. Like When I was when I graduated from college and moved to the Bay Area, I had this great job. I worked in tech. like I worked at Intuit. I was well-employed, but I was so lonely, and I was so desperate to hang out with other Black people. I was in the club on like Sunday nights. Hindsight again, terrifying. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Just get up in the morning and go to work. <laughs> right, Just, right. Not even like this is the Lord's day. This is the evening before I got to get up and be at work. <laughs> <It's> terrible. <laughs> so I was in San, downtown San Jose in the clubs. There was this one club that everybody went to, and they would have like these little, you know, B list, C list rappers come in, like do appearances in the club. So the game was always like get into the section. So, you know, I'm like, okay, we're going to get in the section. And there was this one random rapper was in town and his flight was at like six or seven and the club ends at like three or four or something like that. So I was like, okay, cool. Because we got in this whole situation with this whole debacle where my face wound up on baller alert the next morning. Wait, you can't say we end up in this whole situation where my, like you skip, it's a whole, 
it's a whole it's a whole situation missing <laughs> like <laughs> so basically i was with this i'm trying not to incriminate somebody else i was with this <laughs> okay and basically some money got misplaced you know my when they do appearances they pay you in cash typically mm-hmm. like the big bags of cash like that that stuff is real uh, to a point where i'm like where is the money like this 500 i can't remember how much it was called like 500 dollars which again you're 20, 22, 23 years old. And I'm like, where is the money? So I'm like, bro, I'm driving an Audi. Like I can go to the bank right now and like go to the ATM and get you this, the difference of what you're missing. Like we don't need to have problems, but he had already like tweeted it or something. He was like, these girls took my money. I was like, <laughs> I'll never be able to run for office at the time. I thought mm. I wanted to be a politician. I was like, no, no, flag on the play. And I think, <laughs> so then, you know, you wake up and you just think, okay, I just had like a terrible, you know, terrible night. And I go to work, whatever. I didn't know that he had tweeted or anything. And I'm texting his manager. I'm like, yo, people are blowing me up. Like, what's that? Like, what is this? And he's like, oh, well, we took it down. But by then it already got picked up. Da, da, da. And I'm like, So what I hear you saying is yeah. you were a pioneer in the internet long before we knew you were a pioneer. What I hear you saying is God was showing you already that it's going to be internet and success, but maybe not in the way. Not the way that okay. I needed it to be. Or what I really felt like at that time was if you continue on this trajectory, no matter how smart you are, no how, yeah. how much smarter you think you are than other people, if you're in the mix, you're in the mix. You need to be very selective about yeah. who you're associating with, figure out how you want to represent yourself in this space. Yeah. Because you look just like every other bobber Everybody. in the club. Yeah. <laughs> so why would you be treated differently? You know, That's so good. I think that like my, when they called the police on me after I was trying to make sure people understood that I wasn't the one or the two, I really like, even in what I do now, I have a heart for women who are, who have experienced incarceration or Mm -hmm. are incarcerated because like, that was one of those moments where I'm like, you could literally be in prison, like not just arrest, like in prison. I think about me waitressing at the strip club. No one in my family knew I was waitressing there. My boyfriend at the time knew he wasn't like making sure I got in and out safely. There were so many times where people were like propositioning me. Mm-hmm. Can I take you home? You're going to give me this. What you like I could anything could have happened to me. So I totally get like when I look back, like I know that God was really trying to help me help myself, even when I was giving him nothing to work with. <laughs> We were giving him nothing. <laughs> but that's the power. That's how you know, like, it's not you. Like, it, it has to be him. You know, and that's yeah. that's how I always remind myself. So, you know, for anyone who's listening in, who's had their ratchet hours for years. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> and it does not have to define you. <laughs> yes, this is well. <laughs> okay, so tell me about your upcoming book. I mean, I felt like Women Evolve was, like, a really great book. It tells your whole story, like... It gives people frameworks. What made you decide that you wanted to write another book? It's funny because I was actually working on a different book when I wrote this book. Our word of the year, each year for Woman Evolve, I give a word of the year. And like everything we do is built around this word. So last year we had like revolution. I think the year before that, it was something about like coming out or breaking out. And Mm -hmm. this year when I started praying, like God gave me the word hope, which I have to be honest, like it wasn't sexy for me because like hope is like, you know, it's cute, but like, what are we going to talk about all year long? So I've been my podcast around this, our newsletters, our everything centers. And I'm like, how we're going to exhaust hope within a month or so. And the more that I started like digging into hope, I realized that there was so much to unpack about it that I decided, okay, I'm going to take a break from writing this book that I really feel like I'm called to write to really put all of my thoughts about hope into one book. Hmm. And I think the biggest thing that I discovered, and it's like a little book of hope. It's not like a huge book. It's a little book of hope that has so much big impact because oftentimes we think that hope is going to come in the form of an opportunity. We think it's going to come in the form of a person of us checking a box. Like if I get this, I'll be full of hope. And we have history of like this job opened up and my hope opened up. 
But what I discovered is that hope is really a perspective. It's a mindset. It's a mentality. And so the title is literally all hope is found. Mm -hmm. Not all hope is lost, right? But all hope is found rediscovering the joy of expectation. Because if I can shift my mindset and shift my perspective, instead of waiting for hope to come to me, I will discover the hope that is literally overflowing in my life every day. And so it was just like one simple thing. I was taking my kids to school and we had left the house five minutes later. I'm like, I hope I make it on time. How many times are we using the word hope throughout our day? And that hope is being fulfilled. Like we made it on time and I was just like moved on to the next thing. But what if that small fulfillment of hope was a seed for me to hang on to as I went throughout the rest of my day? Because if hope is being fulfilled in this area, then what about these big, great areas where I feel hopelessness? If I can hang on to the hope that I did found, I believe that it echoes in those other areas. So this was all about shifting your mindset and perspective so that you discover the hope that's in your life right now. Love that. It it reminds me too, I think when something works out, then we take it for granted as opposed to saying, acknowledging that there was a chance that it, it, it couldn't or wouldn't work out and yeah. acknowledging and being appreciative of the fact that it did. Right. So to your point, so many times per day, I probably say like, I don't agree, but I hope it works out. Like you know, <laughs> my team or I'm like, they're safely, like, I hope you get there safely. Or I hope, right. Like I, I definitely say hope a lot when it does work out, you move on. Like you don't like yeah. acknowledge that was hope fulfilled, right? So I think that's mm-hmm. that's really interesting. Who was your target demo when you decided to write the book? Like who was your like ideal reader given that your community is so broad and so vast? Uh, well, I think that at the time when I first started writing it, it was really based off of the comments I was getting on social media where people were waiting on Hope in big areas, hoping for a partner, hoping for a career path, hoping to start a business. And people who have big hopes. Because when you have big hopes and it takes time for big hope to be fulfilled, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. And so for me, the target demo are people who are nursing the sickness of a heart where hope has not been fulfilled and helping them to hang on and treasure hope that is being fulfilled. Because if we see it on paper, how many times hope is fulfilled versus those hopes we're waiting on, we'll see that like hope is fulfilled more often than not. If you just document how many times you're saying hope throughout the day, you'll notice like hope is really showing up in my life. And if Mm -hmm. hope is showing up in my life and I can trust is here every single day, then maybe this heart disease, like maybe it doesn't have to ruin me just because I haven't seen it fulfilled in this particular space. And my prayer is that it restores people's expectation and joy in a world that is constantly clawing at it. My recent episodes, I did a joint episode with my partner, Josh, and uh, I've never like a relationship. I would never post any man on my feed. Like you would get maybe. Best I remember night. when y'all went public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, at best, you would get like me walking with someone with male shoes with like tops. Like, <laughs> you weren't getting face, but you know, with him, I wanted to share our love because I was just so grateful, and I felt like uh, so many of my friends, so many women that follow me, are typically really ambitious people who have spent a lot of time building their career, building their profession, building their business. And we're losing hope, losing hope that they were going to find their match. We're losing hope that they were going to find someone without them feeling like they lowered their standards or they had to settle for something. And I had felt like that at times, you know, I was like, well, this is just the best I'm going to get. Like, maybe I just need to be okay with it and just, push through and decided not to go that route. And I made an intentional decision not to go that route and looked odd for people. When I moved from LA and moved to Nashville, it looked like is something wrong, you know? And the answer was, yes, there is something wrong. I must redirect. Like if I'm going to continue to be hopeful about my balance in life and the life I wanted to build outside of my career, my profession then I needed to take some action to fulfill that and push me in the right direction. So I guess I'm curious from your perspective, how do you encourage people to not just lean back to receive and actually like take action if there's something that you want to have? 
Well, you know, I think it's really interesting that you brought up you moving because I think you have to be willing to ask yourself, like, does this current environment and atmosphere support the thing that I'm hoping for? Like, can it survive in this atmosphere and environment? I remember, I don't even know how, because it's not like we talk on the phone, but I don't know why we had a conversation about you moving to Nashville Yeah. or when you first got there. Do you remember I this? Think this is, was it DM to where we on the phone? Maybe we maybe it was the I don't know maybe I don't know how because yeah. it's not like I'm just like hey I'm calling Morgan but I remember because like L A in my opinion mm-hmm. is not necessarily the place people go to say I'm going to settle down and start a family no oh, it's definitely it's not. not we should be clear <laughs> to the people yeah not that yeah. Place. But is it the place where I'm going to go and make connections and build my career? Yes, for sure. There's space there. So I think really recognizing from a practical standpoint, like, is this environment conducive to the thing I'm hoping for? Like, is it even set up to facilitate this dream? Mm. That's an externally, but also internally. Like, am I in a place internally where my heart is open and able to facilitate the type of love that I desire? I am anti-conversations that center a woman's singleness around something she needs to do better. Mm. But also, I'm aware enough to recognize that many of the things that we desire in partnership is going to be confrontational to have someone who is equally able to support you and help you think things through means that we have to work through some of our control issues and we have to be vulnerable and those things are challenging and difficult and so making sure even if we don't know how we're going to be vulnerable that we're open to conversations that are going to create vulnerability open to having dialogue with someone where they are dissecting why we are the way that we are so that we have an environment that can facilitate the very thing that we're hoping for. So I think being an active participant in your destiny is really important. It doesn't mean still, it doesn't mean that everything's going to happen for you, but to be able to say that I did my part, I made space for it, I'm open for it, and I found joy in waiting. I traveled the world, I ate the pasta, (laughs) I found a way to say, like, if this never happens, Mm -hmm. I have a life that is worthy of me living then that's okay for me too. So I think being open and engaged, but also not making it pressure. I hope everyone is listening to that because I feel like so many people expect an outcome, but aren't willing to go through that mental process of, okay, am I creating space for this? And it's my behavior in alignment with my dream, my outcome, my hope. And if it doesn't happen, have I? am I satisfied and happy and fulfilled and what I call living a rich, juicy life, regardless mm-hmm. of this outcome, whether it's a relationship or it's business, you know, same thing as an entrepreneur, like you meet so many entrepreneurs and founders who want some sort of business success. They want to, you know, quit their job and have a full-time income coming from their, their side hustle, make that their main hustle. They want to raise their first round of funding. They want to be able to hire three, four employees so that they can take a vacation, but then they're not creating the environment to facilitate that. Yeah. Uh, Can I tell you the first time I had to hire someone, I hated it. I hated it. Really? What was your first (laughs) hire? My first hire was my full-time assistant. Okay. That one was not as hard for me. The very first really important hire that I made was my director of operations. Everyone else was like a contractor or part-time. It it wasn't a career. It was like, you know, startup positions or people who were good at something that I'm like, sure, I'll plug this in. It can be your side hustle. But when I realized like, okay, I'm going to really need someone who has a full-time job with skills and experience to support where we're headed. I hated the idea of someone's livelihood depending on this thing working out. So my heart goes out to all of you who are in that position. But you know what really helped me is like when I made the salary offer, like there was a part of me that felt because I'm making this salary offer, I need to have this much salary in the bank. And I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have this much in the bank right now. I just need to make sure that you have it in two weeks. (laughs) That's right. The way the direct deposit is set up. I don't have to have all of this. I don't yes. have to have all of this. And I can, I have enough right now to let you know if I'm ever not going to have it and you need to start looking somewhere else. But I think sometimes our dreams are so big and the things that we need in order to facilitate those dreams are so big. But there's not any, you know, 
partnerships that I've made with people, any investments that I've made where they required every single thing do and pay at the same time. Right. They they out here really giving payment plans, y'all. Like, yes. life is on the firm. Life is on the firm. Building your business is on the firm. Yes. Take your time, take a deep breath, and just trust that you are going to be able to increase your productivity by having the right people in place and ultimately increase that bottom line so that you can continue to facilitate what is necessary to build this business. But I just, that right there, it was a struggle for me. And now we have like 18 employees Ooh. and I'm like, yeah. And I didn't have to let anyone go during the pandemic when yeah. we weren't gathering, which a lot of what we do was, is it event centered. Right. And so when we pivoted to digital, I started to hire writers and graphic designers. So we got like, hey, everything's for producers, editors, like everything's fine. We can keep this thing going. Right. It's, that's another God thing because there ain't no way. There ain't no way. I saw the accounts. It ain't no way. <laughs> <laughs> but every couple of weeks, it, it happened for them so good to hear people like us talk about these things sometimes because it can look like everything seamless and effortless. And it's like, no, like at every level, there are new pressures and expectations and things that you have to manage and have faith to like, this is going to work itself out. We're going to grow the business. So the cash is in my bank account. Now my accounts receivable today is going to be smaller than my accounts receivable in a quarter from now. So we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when my accounts receivable started going up there, I was like, this is both very like great. And also I feel very hood rich. Like you owe me a lot of money. (laughs) Because that's man, uh, planning this conference right now has been an eye opening experience. Yeah. Tell me about your conference. It's been, I mean, you sell like stadiums. Yeah. It's incredible. It's really something. So we were to- we have done like six or seven tours. Mm-hmm. So we load up four buses and I mean, we've got crew, we've got the whole thing. We go from city to city and we were doing, you know, arenas and during our tour or like really big theaters. But our conference experience is different. We have 40,000 women coming to Arlington, Texas, which is where the MLB Texas Rangers play. Yeah. Just a difference, honestly, in an arena event versus a stadium event. The yeah. ceilings are much taller. So right. rigging the screens and right. the whole thing that I just I didn't know about. I think that's the hardest part about being a leader mm-hmm. in uncharted territory is that you don't even know what to ask. So even Mm -hmm. though my dad has experience, like I would not even know to ask him about the ceiling height difference and the impact that's going to have on the production budget. And so Mm -hmm. I'm getting these budgets and these things and I'm like, okay, so we talking, okay. (laughs) Yes, but here's the thing. People underestimate this stuff. Like, I mean, Afrotech is 20, 25,000 people. We have the convention centers, wherever we go, we get yeah, there multi hotels, room blocks. Yeah, like, yeah. Of those permits, like I think people take for granted the production operations, the logistics behind being a business operator of large scale events, and not only that, but the cost up front. Baby, they want that money. <laughs> they, they want their money <laughs> before the event happens. They do, or you're not going to be able to hear, and they're not going to be able to see. And it's so funny because of what we do. They're like, you know, it's a shame you charging people to come to church. And like, I am not charging you to come to church. You know, this is a specialized event. Like, we make sure we have Your quarterly consumer? women's meeting. Yeah. Your audience thinks that should be no. free. There, there are people who come on my social media, and they're like, I can't believe that you're making people pay to come to church. And it's like, I'm not, We're not sure. making sense. Sundays, the doors are open. There's no membership fee. There's no, You come right on in there. You sit down. If you want a women's event, we have those every other month. You come on in there. You sit down. There's an opportunity to give because there is a cost in doing it, and we'd like to continue doing it, but we're going to have it whether you give or not. But for this particular event where I'm renting out a stadium, where we have police, where we have permits, where we have screens, where we have microphones, where we have the best of the best coming in from all over the world, because you really don't want me queuing videos and they don't run. You really don't want the mics going out because then you're going to tell me it was raggedy and you're not going to believe that you spent your money coming and I couldn't even get the mics to turn on. But I was trying to save money so that I didn't have to charge so people could come into this. You know what I mean? So it's like this, this balancing 
act of yeah. trying to facilitate these huge moments while also navigating the reality that people have abused their you know, places in ministry and they've abused people's resources and funds. But I do also have a legitimate something that is, I believe, worthy of investment and also optional, you know? Totally optional. Your YouTube is free. I mean, your whole, there's a whole list of stuff that you do. There's a whole that list. So if you need a whole to receive the value, it is available to you for free. I mean, I completely yeah. agree with you. And frankly, same way with, with Afrotech, like people will say, why is the ticket so high? I'm like, do you see this lineup? Did Wale perform? We got Rick Ross perform. Rick Ross ain't going nowhere for free. Right. They're not coming out the goodness of their heart. Like, just so y'all know, they don't even put these seats out out of the good because they don't want you to be on the floor. They don't care about that. You know what I'm saying? They don't care about this carpet. And then they want us to clean up when you leave. They want. (laughs) Okay. I'm like, and I didn't even give y'all the basic chairs because I know y'all want to sit in the comfy chair. So I Because you want a little cushion. Do you know they charge? (laughs) I thought about you. (laughs) I think people would be so surprised when they if they saw the equipment rental line items alone for like the price we pay to rent the couches for two days is the price of the couch. The couch. Which like you say, well, you should just buy the couch, but then where am I going to put the couch? <laughs> where, where am I going to uh, put the couch? There was a moment when Summit 21 was running where I like, I was so stubborn. I made my team get a warehouse in Atlanta because I was like, this is dumb. Like, it's crazy. If we're going to do this event every year, like just buy the stuff because I refuse to yeah. spend yeah. 100K on couches and chairs. It's random, and I know this probably at this point is just us talking because we are at Globe Life Field, uh-huh. and I am just trying to figure out, like, we're going to do it again next year. Right. But it's also, like, we start, We had to move to Globe Life Field. So my mm-hmm. dad does this passing the baton thing. I was going to have it at his church. Right. It holds about 10000 I had 3500 last time we had a conference. I'm like, that, that's that's plenty of room in one, like, I think within two days, we had 10,000 people registered. It's not even for a year. Okay. Right. Within a month, we had 20,000 people. And it's just like, I have never, I set the prices before I had the venue. So now mm-hmm. that I have to pivot. So it wasn't, it's all just tangled up and I'm catching up and everything's fine. Hey y'all. Hey podcast. This is the journey. This is this the is journey. journey. <laughs> this and is then I'm the like, journey. where are the sponsors at? Because that's really how you offset when it's like the ticket prices don't pay for the things. Do you find yeah. that you have challenge getting sponsors because of it's spiritual? Yeah, for sure. I mm-hmm. think I, I think because it's spiritual, I've had to invest in the technology that allows us to really profile so that mm-hmm. we can tell them specifically who's coming. Because that's another thing. It's like you're having numbers, but like, who are they? Are they business women? Are they interested in financial education? So we've had to, and that's an investment, right? So in order to get the money, you got to invest yes. to make your case. So it's a cycle. But def- yes, I've had challenges because it's spiritual. Toyota was a great partner with us mm-hmm. when we toured. But I also think a lot of it has to do with us being predominantly Black women within the yeah. Woman Evolved movement and just people still not really trusting the value of the Black dollar, nope. the value of the Black community, when you empower them, what you get in return, and how it can shift your organization, community's culture, that relationship. Right. And I have found that Black consumership is very loyal, right? Like if we find something we like, we stick to it. Yes. And if we feel like somebody's for us, we're loyal to them. Yeah. But it is definitely difficult to get brands to believe in that. I mean, I had to shut down Summit 21 for that same reason, right? Like the yeah, impact hard. from a consumer perspective. I think you spoke in 2018 or 19. The consumer involvement was beautiful, right? Like our community was there. This was it felt like a different type of event. And the caliber of women and speakers that we were inviting, a lot of people were getting on stage for the first time. Like it was just a really beautiful moment. The cost of the event to scale it to now reach the momentum that we were having would have required a, a, a huge investment dollars from sponsors. And they were willing to invest some amount of money, but it was right. so small relational to the impact and influence of, of the audience that we had. It just wasn't going to work out. And we did actually, now that I'm talking about it, I also felt like my ticket price was going to have to go down as we got bigger for the similar similar reasons that you talked about, just getting feedback of like, why should I have to pay $100, $400 to learn 
how to live a half healthier life or have better habits or get a job as a black woman. I'm already underfunded, yeah. overlooked. And I'm like, I agree with you, sis. Like, I don't disagree with you. So if I can't, yeah. if I can't meet your expectations on experience and your price point of what you think you're willing to pay through sponsors, I got to be out this game. It's the ticket price, but I also know for most people, it's like the hotel, the airfare, the whole thing. I get it. Yes. Yeah, it's the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So we gave away 2,000 tickets to wow. uh, Woman Evolve because like, I just wanted to make sure as many. So that we set it up where like, if you uh, can handle coming to the city and the ticket price is the only thing standing in your way, sign up. We'll take care of your ticket. We didn't tell them how many we were giving away, but I told my team like, say yes to whoever signs up. And that ended up being about 2,000 women. It is hard. It's hard because especially I think as Christians, like we do want these like world class, you know, amazing environment that's like, hey, I, I, I stopped doing X, Y, and Z because I'm trying to get my life together. That's right. But I want to go somewhere where it feels like I got a little jazzy, I did yes. a little two step, but I also lifted my hands and went home. Yes. And creating those environments, it's it's costly. It really is costly. And so even now we're like trusting God that everything's going to be fine, but just this, like, it, it's been an incredible learning experience. The biggest thing, and maybe I'll do a whole podcast on it, because I think I actually get this question quite a bit, which is like, how do you get corporate sponsors? And you already said is right is the right thing, right? It's like the data and everything and being able to show the value of the customer and who you have. So even at Afrotech, we have these things called beacons where every uh, kit, when you have your ticket, we can track where you are in the convention center. We're not tracking you when you go home. Don't worry. The convention center, we know where you're going, where, you know, just kind of the radius of where you are and how much time you're spending so that we can say, look, like people really are sitting here in these stages learning about these topics and you should sponsor your employee. I think consumer experiences are really, really tough because you can't get the corporate learning and development budget. It's really brand. So really you're going up against like an essence fest. Right, right, right. Um, and I, yeah, I know that well. We'll be in October in 2024. So it was like July uh, is Essence Fest and then we're in September. So it's like, man, the proximity, we were talking to some of the same brands and it just, and we, and we basically are sharing some of the same women, at least on paper. So yeah. The date matters, okay. the quarter matters. It's so many mm-hmm. different things. So I guess just to wrap in closing, those who have who are now familiar with your journey and are interested in getting involved in your community, what is the best entry point for them? Is it the YouTube and just like watching some of your most popular videos? Do you think it's the podcast? What do you think? I think it is whatever way you prefer to consume information. So YouTube is going to be mostly me and my sermons and messages. Mm -hmm. Podcast is going to be pretty similar to conversations like this with other women unpacking their journey, what they're learning about themselves and God, their past, their future. Social media is going to be primarily things that you get to treasure in your heart. Also that weekly newsletter. So We've got a scripture. We've got a thought that breaks down that scripture and then a prayer over you each week that we're sending out. We've got community text messages so you can send out, you know, you can get your weekly inspiration right to your phone. So I think it's all about what touch point you prefer, but it's all outlined definitely on our website, womanevolve.com. I'm not sure when this is coming out, but we also have the Woman Evolve app. That is where you can get all of that inspiration I just mentioned and courses and the book club, but also just connect with women who are kind of like trying to buckle down on like, what does faith look like for this modern woman? And how do I begin to pivot my life in a way that allows me that expression? Absolutely beautiful. And I also just have to highlight as the brand person in me, Did you all hear how each different platform has a different value and interaction? Mm -hmm. If you want to hear more about that, you can listen to my podcast with Ronnie from a few weeks ago and where we actually talk about building your brand and like doing exactly what Sarah just said in terms of on text message. I'm not trying to get the YouTube video. Right. (laughs) right. I'm on the newsletter. I'm not trying to see a picture or going to, you know, Italy <laughs> yeah, for different reasons for different platforms so the goat right here in so many different ways thank you so much for spending some time with us today 
Uh, my pleasure. I enjoy you. I feel like we should be friends in real life. I know. Um, Come I don't know how we make that happen. I would, it's not far from Dallas. It's, it's not, not far, far from, from Dallas. Dallas. Well, it's so fun. If you guys haven't spent up time up here, like... We're always in and out, but we do have a good time. And PT's got a label, and you know they do so much music yes. out of Nashville. So I'm just going to tag along on yes. his next trip. Well, Josh and him text come. a lot. I don't know if you knew that. I don't know that. They're like friends. Okay. Yeah, they... Oh, okay. They became friends well, then we need to beat last them. Year. Yeah. Not them being ahead of us. We have work to do. <laughs> no, but like, what are you doing? Like oh, no, I'm just like, sir. <laughs> Wait a minute. Stop that. <laughs> so fun. Um, all right, my love. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. Take See care. Ya. Thanks for listening to the Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.